All right, everybody, uh, welcome to our July community webinar. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, my name is Lillian Hogendorn. I am the Acting Manager of Digital Access and Open Educational Resources at eCampus Ontario, and it is my joy and pleasure to get to host these webinars every month um, and to see what's going on in our community and also share what we are doing at eCampus Ontario um, with you guys. Today's webinar, we're gonna be talking about an ongoing project that we're working very closely uh, with a couple students from uh, library schools across the province on. Um, and we're really gonna give them a chance to shine. And they're gonna talk about uh, how we are growing our OER collection um, to make it uh, more useful, more representative, more discoverable. Um, I'll let them get into it. But uh, first, I'd like to, to introduce um, our two excellent panelists today. Um, so you might recall uh, a little while ago we ran a search for a couple, for two um, OER collections development interns uh, who were current students at library schools. And um, we had just an overwhelming response from really amazingly talented people across the province. Um, but I'm really excited uh, that we have Vanya and Samantha with us because they both represent a really different take on this uh, question that we're grappling with. Um, so Vanya is currently an MLIS student, a Master of Library and Information Science student at uh, Western University. And over the last year, he's worked as an archives assistant, a teaching and learning co-op student at Brock University, as well as a specialty coffee consultant. He's got an MA in art history and visual culture from the University of Guelph. Um, but uh, he also studied early medieval manuscripts and stone monuments. Vanya, I would love to talk to you more about that at some point. Um, <laughs> but during his uh, current studies in his MLIS program, he's really developed an interest in instructional design, open education, leadership, and research impact in bibliometrics with a focus on developing equitable and meaningful metrics for standard and emerging scholarship practices. Um, Vanya has an enormous amount of expertise uh, in OER for somebody that has sort of just started their MLIS and thinks really critically uh, about, about issues of access. Um, and the other person we have with us today is Samantha. Uh, she's currently a Master of Information student at the University of Toronto. Uh, she has an undergraduate degree in cognitive psychology and has taken that love for the understanding of structural organization of the brain to begin crossing into the parallel systems in library and information science, like information architecture and metadata. Um, so through her work in developing a library pilot project to bring a carpentries to the University of Toronto community, she's been able to see the impact of open education uh, on educators and learners, and she's hoping to support the continued development and engagement of open access communities. And uh, Samantha really brings to, to the table uh, this excellent understanding of how uh, the, the infrastructure that we build that, that can seem so tedious really can change the way that our collection works and the way that people can access our collection. Um, and she'll be talking about that today. So why now? Why are we growing our OER collection now? Well, first of all, there's an emerging need in the province for better access to online resources and to adaptable resources. As we move to, um, we move to remote teaching, we move to hybrid, teaching, we move to a more uncertain uh, world. Um, we've seen interest in open educational resources grow. Um, but we also have this unique opportunity to really engage with the future of OER at a critical point uh, in OER's history, or as I see it. Um, we have this opportunity to engage with Vanya and Samantha, both of whom are deeply connected with um, the theory as well as the practice of their respective areas of expertise. Um, and I'm so excited to see um, what we can do when we really maintain that connection and build something um, that hasn't really been built before. And finally, um, we want to nurture a collection of sharing. So you'll see our project is not done, <laughs> um, not even close to done. Um, but we want to share with you where we are now, uh, work that's been done, work that's in progress, and work that is coming. And we hope that by doing that and by demonstrating that, we'll encourage you to share as well. So hopefully this conversation that we're gonna have um, in the next you know, 40 minutes is, is gonna spark some ideas for you about things you might wanna share um, with, the, with the community in Ontario of educators. Um, 
things that you might know of that someone else might be willing to share, um, or ideas that you might have for how we can improve the sharing of curricular resources in the province. Um, but I'm talking <laughs> far too much. It is um, my great pleasure to turn this over to Vanya right now, uh, and he's going to talk to you more about what he has been working on. So uh, go ahead, Vanya, take it away. Thanks, Leighton, and hi, everyone. Um, okay, we're going to start with the collection development policy um, and uh, what, what we've uh, done with it so far. Uh, from the outset, one of the key components toward uh, actively growing the open library collection has been the creation of this OER collection development policy. Although we're currently in the drafting stage, um, we're very excited to share how the work is progressing, as Lillian mentioned, and ultimately open it up to you, our community, uh, for feedback and suggestions. Next slide, please. Uh, to give you an overview of the policy, uh, I'm going to briefly talk about what a collection development policy is, um, how we have gone about creating one uh, for the open library, and finally, how we envision the policy in action. So what is a collection development policy? Uh, broadly speaking, a collection development policy is a framework and a set of guidelines or parameters um, around the collection of materials within which library staff and users work. Often, uh, collection development policies are one component of post-secondary, public, or special library acquisition and subscription strategies. They're documents typically, um, that typically provide information and guidelines which uh, may be used for the selection of relevant materials for the community the library serves. Uh, often they outline the goals and objects of the library itself. Um, they describe how the collection um, supports these goals and objectives. And ultimately they serve as a mode of communication between the library and its community toward a mutual understanding of what the collection includes, what its priorities are, and how it goes about collecting those materials. I think it's important to underscore that collection policies are uh, a community document. Uh, in many ways, the policy is sort of like an informal contract. It, it's a means of communication, in our case, between eCampus Ontario and um, Ontario's OER community. So why is this important? Um, the policy itself is important um, because it provides us with clear directions and guidelines towards a sustainable service model uh, that facilitates continued growth of the collection. Um, additionally, the policy is a living document, as I mentioned, within which the open library may continually adapt to emerging pedagogies, resource types, and technology-enabled learning practices. Um, and finally, the policy um, ensures that the open library continues to provide value to educators and learners through the ongoing and transparent uh, development of our own practices based on community-driven priorities. Uh, we really wanted this document uh, to reflect not only the mission of um, the open library, but also reflect our community of educators and OER uh, creators across the province. So creating the policy. Um, one of the first steps uh, we took toward developing the policy itself was to conduct an environmental scan in an effort to explore uh, the general structure uh, of this policy, of this type of policy, uh, what the sections might include, um, and if any OER specific uh, policies exist that we could use as a template. As it turned out, uh, there were very few OER collection development policies out there. Uh, most policies that were discovered were created by post-secondary or public or special libraries um, and include sections such as mission and purpose statements, uh, resource types and formats, selection and deselection criteria, uh, scope, uh, details about donations and gifts, accessibility, and, and so on, and, and much more. Uh, as we began outlining the open library policy, uh, we recognized that not all of these sections apply to OER, um, and furthermore, that we would need to build on these components to reflect the OER context. Um, as a community document, we wanted to include information that would make this policy really useful uh, to OER creators and adapters, and not just those of us in the background who are supporting the growth of the collection itself. So what kind of information have we included so far? 
Well, broadly, the policy has been divided into two sections. Um, the first is an introductory section. Uh, it provides helpful information about the open library itself, uh, its mission, and um, the policy's uh, purpose. Um, it also outlines a collection objectives um, and the communities it serves and includes a definition of OER. So this is a really good um, foundation uh, for anyone who might be new to OER or um, experienced OER creators um, to just get a, a foundational um, uh, uh, knowledge and information of, of what this policy, um, what this policy uh, and who this policy serves rather. The second section of the policy outlines the um, collection development components and it includes information about required and recommended criteria for deposit into the library. Um, it also describes the scope of the collection, so covering topics like subject areas, resource uh, types and formats. Um, it includes information about open licensing and copyright um, and the main uh, avenues toward depositing those resources, uh, mainly uh, creator submissions and media deposits. So what do we collect? Uh, broadly, uh, the Open Library aims to collect and preserve, um, oh, I think it's the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, it uh, aims to collect and preserve OER that are openly licensed, um, and we're here to help with that, uh, and include at least one editable file. These are the foundational elements of, the open, uh, of open educational resources. Uh, sorry, Lillian, one slide back. Um, so in addition, uh, it was important that we include information in the policy about our ongoing efforts uh, to collect materials created and shared by Indigenous uh, knowledge keepers, as well as Francophone content and resources that include the Canadian context more broadly. That's really important to us and our um, Ontario educators and learners. Uh, eCampus serves diverse communities to, um, across the province, and so it was essential that the policy reaffirm our mission uh, toward an inclusive and representative collection of resources um, for, our, for all educators and learners in Ontario. Uh, we're also looking toward diversifying, diversifying the types of resources uh, that we collect by emphasizing in the policy uh, the immense value of materials like syllabi, slide decks, and other non-textbook curriculum materials. And Sam will talk more about that um, later on in the webinar. Okay, next slide, please. Um, eCampus Ontario offers an array of tools and services, as we all know, uh, like Pressbooks and the H5P Studio, the aid in creating, um, adapting, and using OER in the classroom. Uh, the collection development policy is, uh, in our view, um, the latest addition to this toolkit, one that aids in facil facilitating the growth of the open library by providing essential guidelines, answering common questions, and making transparent eCampus Ontario's continued commitment toward developing a truly representative and inclusive collection. Uh, we envision that the uh, that prospective and experienced OER creators, as well as educators, will consult uh, the policy during uh, the OER development stage to align their work with the open library um, and to ensure that the final product um, has a dedicated home um, with optimal discovery and preservation for the benefit of, of everyone. Um, from the outset, we believe that this policy would be a, a living document, as I mentioned, that will evolve as community, as um, our community evolves and adapts to emerging needs. Um, as we move toward finalizing the first iteration of this policy in the coming weeks, we would really value hearing from you, our community partners, to understand what, what you would like to see in the a document that would help reduce the barriers uh, for creators and adapters in making their hard work more visible. And as a result, uh, more widely used in classrooms across Ontario. And so to that end, uh, we're gonna move on to the metadata aspect. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm really excited to share with you my side of the project, which is the metadata side of things. Um, and overall, uh, I just wanna specify that the metadata projects are an extension of the collection development policy. Um, there are means to enact the policy developments and facilitate evolution of the library service in line with the ongoing pedagogical developments in the larger community. Um, and if you're not familiar, uh, metadata is the descriptive information attached to all of our library resources. Um, 
and we use them to sort of facilitate our search capabilities in the online library. Um, metadata elements are things um, like the title or the author or the license information. And so each resource has its own sort of record of metadata specific to it. Um, and so what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be looking at the projects um, that we're undertaking and kind of give you a look into the possible future directions that this metadata work may enable. So for the first project we did, so surprise, uh, we did an environmental scan. So we um, looked at OER metadata standards, guides, usages, um, and we wanted to get a grasp of the wide variety of metadata schemas and their use specific considerations in order to help guide us in our creation of um, one for our library. Um, so we looked at the DSpace repository specifications because obviously we need to work within DSpace for our repository. So we can't go outside of what that enables us to do. Um, and then we looked at our own standard that we're using now, see what elements we're using and um, really get a good idea of what we have and how we can use it. And then we, we broadened out and we looked at um, metadata standards from external communities and external, um, I guess, professional organizations uh, like the, um, the IEEE LOM, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Um, they have a metadata schema called the Learning Object Metadata. Um, there's OER Commons Learning Object Metadata Schema, the LM, sorry, the LRMI Learning Resource Metadata Initiative, and the schema.org schemas, as well as the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting Specifications. Um, so we wanted to understand their usages as well as their limitations, look at their guidelines, and see the future directions that they're taking and ones that we can kind of connect on to and use for our own purposes. Um, and really it was a way to determine a way to align ourselves to fit our needs and keep doors open for future library development, um, for the future library services, as well as collaborations with community organizations. So we had this proactive engagement with Spark and North American OER community to keep that conversation up and to understand and stay in communication with them about the metadata standards that we want to go forward with. Um, and from this environmental scan, we came up with three sort of key goals. Um, so these three goals that we have, um, while they can stand alone, they, they really work together in a sort of um, holistic way. So discoverability um, is based off of our desire to further facilitate end users' ability to find resources um, by developing this consistent standard for description of resources with metadata. And we want to add in new descriptive elements to increase discoverability within new domains. And this leads to our next goal of usability, where we want to leverage the inclusion of these new metadata elements to facilitate and support the development of our library search features um, to make discovery of resources easier. And that will allow for um, enhancement of service down the road. And then for accessibility, we really want to ramp up our efforts to find ways for our library to support the development of a greater number of accessible resources. And so with those goals in mind, um, we're moving on to the work that we're doing now, which is the development of the metadata application profile. So it, it's really similar to a collection development policy, um, but it's metadata specific. Um, so it's a document that contains all the metadata elements that an organization needs to effectively describe the objects in their repository and gives details of the specific way each of those elements is being used for an intended purpose. Um, our application profile uh, details our usage of specific metadata, metadata elements from the different metadata schemas, like, um, like I mentioned in our environmental scan, like Dublin Core, LMRI, IEEE, LOM, um, et cetera. And so it gives guidance for the consistent application of these standards for every single record we have in our repository. Uh, so for example, um, Let's take the, the metadata element title. 
Um, so there's the title and sometimes there's a subtitle for a resource as well. So what, how do you consistently convey every single time the same standard of a title? Do you include title with, sorry, do you include subtitle with title? How do you connect them? Um, do you connect it with a colon, with a dash? Do you just put them all together? So our metadata application profile specifies exactly how we aim to do that, and that goes for every single um, element beyond just the title. And so our, our outcomes that we um, were hoping to achieve by creating this metadata application profile is to include metadata elements that describe our resources in more detail. So for example, there's the learning material type. Um, there's the genre of the resource that we want to describe. So is it a newspaper? Is it a slide deck? Is it physical? Is it, it's getting an understanding of the actual resource itself. Um, and this all comes down to being able to make use of controlled vocabularies. And we want to, we want to smartly make use of these controlled vocabularies to increase discoverability and better represent the library's collection. Again, as a way to support the direction we're taking with our collection development policy. Um, and finally, we really want to facilitate the ability to include non-accessible resources in the library so that they can be developed because we think that's, that's a really important part of the open education pedagogy is that development process and that remix process. So being able to have non-accessible resources but have them clearly differentiated from the accessible resources opens up an ability for us to communicate with each other and build community around making resources accessible. And so this leads us to possible future directions that we can take with our application profile. Um, so we're laying down, we're trying to lay down the groundwork that enables us to possibly follow these directions in the future and other directions um, based off of your feedback. So um, one, of, one of those examples would be um, an enhanced search functionality for the library. So which search features are really important to you that you would think would be helpful for discovering resources? Um, another example be resource sharing with other repositories through the um, open, open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. So that would enable us to not only share our resources with other repositories, but also selectively take in resources from other repositories and have you be able to search them through our library. Um, another is the ORCID ID integration. So we want, there's the possibility of, for us to give that recognition um, and connection of the resource to the author through the um, Open Researcher and Con Contributor ID, the ORCID ID. Um, another option is the MARC21 format integration. So MARC21, the standard bibliographic format for libraries, um, would allow universities and college libraries to make our resources searchable within their own library catalog. Um, and again, there's, there's other possibilities, and if you have any feedback, we really would like to hear it because this is, this is the time now for us to look at that base level of building our metadata standard to be able to facilitate that. Um, and once we get um, this metadata application profile complete, it'll be, um, it'll be a matter of implementing it within the library so that includes updating all existing records to fit with our new application profile and begin um, taking in the new records, I guess, sorry, the new resources um, with this new standard. And as well, that's the creation of documents like guides um, to facilitate the ongoing compliance and consistent application of the standard so that we do have that consistency beyond the summer pilot project. Um, so looking at our library now, we have 372 resources, we have 66% of which are textbooks, and we have 728 public H5P objects. Um, with everything that Vanya and I have spoken about up to this point, as well as looking at these numbers, we've come up with three main goals for uh, what we like to call our summer of open. Um, 
So goal number one would be to add 125 new resources to our collection. Uh, we, want, we want to bring ourselves up to that total of 500 resources in our open library. Um, our goal number two would be to increase our collection's representation of non-textbook resources. And the third goal would be to integrate the public H5P Studio content into the open library's search functionality. And this is what brings us to asking for your help. Um, and so you can, you can help us reach our goals by sharing your open license resources for deposit into the library. Um, and to summarize what, I guess, the, what we've done with the collection development policy and our metadata application profile is we've opened it up to take in non-accessible materials. Um, we're really focusing on Francophone and Indigenous and Canadian-centric content. And we're really interested in non-textbook materials like syllabi, assignments, modules, courses, simulations, guides, and videos. Um, and obviously, these would be resources that are either already openly licensed or you'd be willing to have openly licensed. But yes, we're, we're here for the media deposit and we're, we're really looking forward to reaching those goals. Okay, yeah, and towards um, achieving these goals and growing the Open Library Collection, um, one key aspect is community engagement, um, like we're doing right now. Um, and there are a few ways that Samantha and I will be sharing our progress as well as starting um, conversations to identify OER um, for deposit into the collection. One way we'll be regularly uh, communicating with you is through the Summer of Open newsletter, uh, which I encourage anyone who's interested uh, to sign up for. There will be a link at the end of the webinar. Um, in this newsletter, Samantha and I will highlight new additions to the library, key benchmarks throughout the pilot, um, and, and the progress of the collection development policy and metadata projects. Another important aspect of growing the collection and meeting our, meeting our goals is connecting with all of our college and university partners to start conversations and explore how we can help um, how we can help through media deposits and ongoing support of identifying existing OER. Um, and making them freely available through the open, open library. So what does this look like? Uh, when you create or uh, find uh, a really good resource, what we will do is apply the appropriate uh, metadata uh, to ensure that there's optimal discovery and preservation. Uh, we will help uh, apply the right open license um, if, if you need help with that. We're here for you. Um, uh, to help um, to find the right license. And finally, we'll add it to the collection quickly and efficiently so that it's available to uh, educators and learners all over Ontario um, just in time for the fall. Uh, we know that there is a lot of amazing OER work that has already been done across um, the province and perhaps now more than ever as post-secondary institutions are integrating um, online learning environments, uh, there's an opportunity to share broadly and highlight the open library as a nexus for open educational resources across Ontario. And, and to that end, we welcome you and would love to hear from you. So please connect with us um, uh, and feel, feel free to email us at oer.deposit.ecampus.ca, ecampusontario.ca, um, and uh, we can start that conversation. And now we're going to open it up to questions. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much, uh, Vanya and Samantha, for a really excellent overview of the work that you guys have been um, doing. Just a reminder that the Q&A is open, um, and I, that we've got plenty of time to answer questions. Also, if you have something to say, you can, of course, raise your hand, and I will find you and unmute you, uh, and so we can start to have um, a discussion. So we've got one question from Joanna here. Um, Vanya and Samantha, can you give an example of non-accessible material that you would be accepting? Um, yeah, so um, non-accessible material would be anything that, um, the, in our list, I don't know, um, Lillian, if you could go back to the list of the types of resources. Um, I think it might have been three or four slides back. Um, but in general, it's, it's any of those, thank you, um, it's any of those types of materials that maybe have not gone through that um, accessibility, um, 
I guess, process and to certify that it is accessible. So we want to we want to open it up so that the the materials that you're not sure are accessible or might have been a little hesitant about bringing forward because you haven't it hasn't gone through that um, process. We that's what we're opening up to. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Lillian. Yeah. Um, so that's if you've got a syllabus and uh, it's not tagged or if if you um, if you've got something going on where you know you don't have the resources on your campus to confidently ensure AODA compliance, what we want to do is still make that resource shareable so that other folks at other campuses um, are are able uh, to to see that see that an accessibility check hasn't been uh, conducted, and if they have the resources on their own campus, remediate that document, and then we'll be working towards a process to bring remediated uh, versions of um, of accessible, uh, inaccessible content back into the library uh, and changing that designation. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps uh, with that. Um, I see a question from Jenny Heyman in the chat. Uh, what type of quality criteria are you using to determine whether objects should be added to the library? Uh, and also hello and waving from Sudbury. Hi Jenny. Uh, Vanya and Samantha, I don't know if you have any anything you want to uh, add Add to that, or um, I'm happy to, to speak to that as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes to uh, criteria for selection, we, uh, as I mentioned, there are two required criteria uh, for the OER, and that is uh, that it, that the OER has um, uh, an open license attached to it, and that it has at least one editable um, uh, file. And when it comes to quality, we are not um, reviewing the quality of the content itself. Um, that is a, a slightly different process, and I'm sure Lillian can speak to that a little bit more. Uh, but the required criteria for inclusion to the open library are um, the open, open license and um, one editable file. And then we also have recommended um, criteria, and they include um, uh, that uh, the resource is uh, compliant with AODA. Um, guidelines or um, WCAG guidelines um, for online uh, materials. And then we have um, uh, other recommendations uh, like different types of files included in the OER, um, includes Canadian uh, content, of course, in the Canadian context. Uh, we'd also uh, love to um, for each or as many OER to be uh, bilingual or offered in, in um, several languages. Um, but And the policy outlines a, a few more. Um, Lillian, Lillian, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so Jenny and everybody, um, you know, we are definitely not equipped at eCampus Ontario to evaluate the curricular value of any particular resource because we're generalists, we're not instructors. So um, to that end, if somebody is suggesting it, they've used it in their teaching, um, we would deem the quality of that resource to be good enough for teaching in Ontario. Um, and, and also, you know, we'll continue our review, our textbook review program, and we're looking at other ways for people to indicate their experience using an OER um, to get more of that community generated feedback. So um, as Samantha mentioned, we'll be doing some uplifting of what our search looks like and also what our catalog records uh, look like and um, really looking for ways uh, to allow the community to do that quality assessment while still having the collection be representative of the curricular content that's being used in Ontario. Um, so, so hopefully that helps. Um, and that also allows us to go a lot faster in terms of growing uh, the growth of the collection. All right, uh, we've got some more questions. Uh, Sarah, I'll be hosting an OER sprint in March 2021. That's exciting. Um, what would be the process for us to connect and collaborate with eCampus Ontario and submitting materials to the open library. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Vanya and Samantha won't be with us in March uh, 2021. Um, if, uh, unfortunately, we, we only have them for the summer. Uh, so um, you can email open at ecampusontario.ca uh, and what we'll have by that point is those documents that Vanya and Samantha have talked about creating that metadata application profile as well as the collection development policy. So we can make sure that you have those well in advance to review to make sure 
that things are um, aligned and we'll be continuing the great work that they're doing to, to make deposit into the library um, easier. So just stay in touch with us at open at ecampusontario.ca uh, and that email goes to myself as well as to um, anyone else who's working on the open library uh, at the time and um, we would be really, really happy uh, to support you uh, as much as we're capable of. I'm really excited about, about that. That sounds really great. Um, Darina, will you accept links to courses that are from accredited training organizations? It's an interesting question, Darina. Um, so I guess I'd have to ask um, if those courses are, are open and have an open license. They would have to meet those criteria. And Vanya, I'm going to let you uh, go ahead and, and remind folks of what those sort of two baseline criteria are. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the baseline criteria for all OER that are included in the open library are that they have um, an open uh, license um, and we can help you uh, uh, with finding the appropriate one for your resource. And the second element um, that we require is that there is at least one editable uh, file, uh, preferably more if you can include them, but at least one um, to make it open. Yeah, and so Darina, for a course that would be like, if there was a Word document version of the syllabus, that would be an editable file that we could take. Um, but essentially, we, we need it to be adaptable in, in some way to be, um, or, or open in, in some way, um, and to have the legal permission of open and also the technical permissions of open. All right, uh, any other uh, questions? Go back to the question slide to, to prompt your, your question. Okay, so if you have any questions uh, that come up after this webinar um, is over. Oh, Joanna, uh, your hand is raised, would you? Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, do you have, more questions are coming in. So, um, Joanna, I'm gonna allow you to talk now. All right. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, hi. Okay, and, and this is more of a comment than, than a question. Um, one, one of the frustrations when searching very inclusive uh, repositories is that, is that you find material that's, that's old or, or something like it's Flash. And I'm just thinking Merlot, you come across Flash tutorials and um, I, I want a way to filter that out. So I, so I wanted to request that there was um, maybe a filter for, for year, uh, like date created, and um, a filter for non-accessible. Yes, yeah, so that's a great um, point. I see Samantha writing that down. That's exactly the kind of information that we're, we're uh, looking for. How can we leverage metadata that we already have, like date of publication, um, to uh, you know, allow a search feature based on data publication um, that will make it, make that metadata more useful to you. So that's super, super helpful. Thanks. Okay. Um, Jenny, I've got another question from Jenny. Um, do you have plans to scrape content from other repositories? Samantha, that question goes to you. That is me. Um, so that that is one of the possibilities. So through Oh, my acronyms again. Open Archives Initiative um, Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. So what that is is essentially a protocol that um, within your repository, you design it so that um, not only you can have access, you allow access to your repository and your um, documents, I guess, resources, um, but that also it enables you to then um, start, I guess, scraping content and resources from other repositories. So that, that is an option that um, we are designing the metadata application profile to enable in the future if that's at the direction that we choose to go. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, and one of the things that we'll do is, is after the webinar wraps, you'll be taken to a survey where you can rank things that you think are important so that we really understand um, where we should focus our time and attention. You know, we only have um, this additional talent with us for 
uh, until the start of the, the academic year. And so we really want to make sure that we drive our time and energy into things that are important uh, to you. The library needs to be a representation of the sort of OER work that's happening um, in Ontario and that's important in Ontario. And so if OER work that's happening in Ontario is we're using content from other repositories um, and we want to bring that in, then like that's really important for us to know so we can, can focus on it. Um, if, if OER work that's happening in Ontario is we need to bring our records into library catalogs through Mark 21, that's really important to us uh, to know so that we can focus uh, in on it and so that we can build out these policies that and, and uh, application profiles that um, really reflect the importance of that work um, and, and sort of cement that for us moving forward. Anyone else have questions or comments? Um, if you have them, now is a great time. If they come up later, um, you can always email oer.deposit at ecampusontario.ca uh, or if you just want to chat with Samantha or Vanya more about the work they're doing and brainstorm, um, I know that we would be really excited to talk to any of you about your priorities and, and what you're um, you know, looking forward to for the next uh, year, next academic year. Um, so I'm just going to keep that email up on the screen for a second. Uh, and as a reminder, we'll make these slides and this recording available. So if you, if you miss it, um, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you that, e that email um, soon. All right, and seeing um, no other questions, um, I am just going to do, um, how do we sign up for the newsletter? Yes, Sarah, great question. Um, so uh, after this, uh, <laughs> this will be taken directly uh, to a link to sign up to the Summer of Open newsletter. It's also pinned on the uh, Ontario uh, Open Library um, Twitter account. Um, a link went out in our eCampus Ontario newsletter. Uh, I'll put a link in the Slack for the Ontario Open Library Network. And um, I'm gonna try to drop a link in this chat now, although I'm not quite sure how to do that while I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> um, so um, I'd also love for you guys to remember that we do these webinars every month, uh, still sourcing a topic for August. They're generally on the second Tuesday of each month uh, at noon. That would be August 11th. Um, so uh, we're still looking for a topic, hoping to feature some, some community members in, in August. If you've got a project you're working on and you really think uh, this is a good forum to talk about it, we'd love uh, to hear from you. And again, after this um, webinar wraps, um, you'll be taken to a quick survey about the, you know, the priorities that we've talked about today and um, what you think, as well as a little place for some open comment. Um, as well as a link to sign up for that newsletter so that you can keep hearing from Vanya and Samantha on their progress throughout the, the summer. You can hear what's new in the library. You can hear, um, you know, when there's an opportunity to review one of these policies um, that we're working on. Uh, and so that we can continue to have this dialogue going outside of, you know, this one hour on a very hot Tuesday afternoon. Um, and that is all I have for you today. So I am going to uh, just give us one more second to say thank you so, so much, Vanya and Samantha, for your time and thoughtful work on, um, on this project. I have um, just been overwhelmed by the perspectives that you guys have, have brought to the table, and I hope that uh, the rest of our community can really see that as well. And with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, sign off. I'm going to stop the recording now. And uh, thanks so much. We'll see you guys next month and see you on the, on the